Hey, what's up, guys? Tom Henderson, the founder of ResGen here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the ResGen Giving Life podcast, where we hear stories and have conversations about life in Christ, integrating our faith into every area of our life, and talk about ways that we as men can give life to others at home, at work, and in the community. I'm excited to get into today's show, but before we do, I want to remind you that tickets for ResGen Men Summit 2024, which takes place on Saturday, February 3rd, are on sale now at resgen.org. This annual ResGen event gathers over 1,100 men here in Sioux Falls and thousands more online at simul and at simulcast sites from 8 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. for a half day of encouragement, laughter, and challenge. This year's speakers include college football analyst David Pollack, executive coach and author Ryan Leake, former Army Ranger and Black Hawk helicopter pilot Jeff Strucker, and North Coast Church pastor Chris Brown. Tickets are only $35 and they will sell out, so I encourage you to get you and your friends registered as soon as you can at resgen.org. Okay, my guest today is a friend of mine who I've known for almost 20 years now. Luke Vanderlees is a follower of Christ, husband, father, and the spiritual life director and Bible teacher at Sioux Falls Christian School. Luke is also the track and cross country coach for Sioux Falls Christian and has coached his teams onto multiple state championships. On this episode of the ResGen Giving Life podcast, Luke and I visit about several topics, including some of the most important things he has learned about teenagers and himself during the last 25 years of ministering to students in a variety of ways, and what teens truly need from parents and adults in general today. We also talk about his coaching philosophy, a philosophy that has no doubt led to great success on the track and cross country course, but more importantly, one that keeps Christ at the center, both during competition and in life. I'm excited you're joining me for this episode, friends. Here's my conversation with Luke Vanderleest. Luke Vanderleest, man, it is so fun to have you on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, dude, we've been we've been talking about this. Uh, really, I think maybe even season two yeah. is when I first said, "Hey, you should come on this." And then we finally have been able to make it work because your schedule is such that it doesn't. It's not very conducive for kind of a mid afternoon shoot like we do these because of of all the stuff that you're doing at Sioux Falls Christian and all your coaching. And we're gonna get into all that, okay? Um, but before we do, I'd love for you, uh, I, I mentioned a few things in the intro, but I'd love for you to personally just introduce yourself to to listeners and viewers here today, and then we'll dive right in. Yeah, sure. So yeah, um, my wife Carla and I have been married for 26 years. Oh, come on. Uh, yeah, we grew up in the middle of Iowa uh, by Pella. Okay. Went to Dort University, got married while we were still in college. Yeah. Moved out to California for a few years. That's where I started my teaching and coaching career. Yeah. And then we moved here in 2001. Yeah. And uh, taught for a year and then took a little break from being in the classroom. Uh, worked full-time youth ministry. And I think that's when you and I first met each other. Right, yeah. The youth pastor at Shalom Christian Reformed Church. That's and, exactly right. Uh, I was still coaching at Sioux Falls Christian at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then transitioned back into the role that I have now as spiritual life director, which really just means I get to teach Bible. I'm yeah. part of the counseling department. Uh, I plan our, our weekly chapels for middle school and high school. I get to coach boys and girls cross country and boys and girls track and field. And, yeah. And along the way, uh, we've been raising three teenagers. One so, of them who is at Dort now. Yeah. You yeah. Know, Derek is uh, is a sophomore there. Yeah. Uh, he'll probably be 20 by the time this thing rolls. His birthday's <laughs> right around the okay. corner. Okay. Um, but yeah, he's uh, at Dort. And then our daughter Katie's a junior. And Levi's a freshman. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, as I mentioned in in the intro, you and I have known each other now for over twenty years. Yeah. And I moved back from Oregon in ninety nine. Yep. And then you came back in in two hundred one or mm -hmm. two thousand one, and uh, and we really got connected pretty promptly. Yeah. Upon your arrival, and and uh, it's just it's been so fun to to grow our friendship, and then just to watch God use you. In, in a variety of different ways, mm -hmm. in all the different platforms that he's given you. And uh, you've stewarded those platforms so well, and from, from teaching to being a youth pastor to, to coaching. Um, and, and really, when you say that you're the spiritual life director, I mean, and you talk about the different hats you wear, it, I mean, that's the title on the business card or on the website mm -hmm. or whatever. But I mean, really what you, you do so well is you're spending time with students. You're spending time with kids. Uh, you've devoted your life to that. Uh, and you do it really well. And so first, I just want to say thank you. You know, thanks for investing your life in in 
not just this generation of teenagers, but I mean, we're talking two decades. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'm now teaching kids who I had their kid, you know, their parents. Oh, man. Yeah, for real. Like there are kids in our middle school right now that I taught their parents when I first moved here. Yeah. So it, it, same thing for, for you, Tom, right? Like, yeah. you know, I think back to those early 2000s, you know, we're doing youth ministry and all the people that we we interacted with, the different, you know, festivals and things that we yeah. did. And the fact that we're both still doing this, like, isn't it crazy that, you know, just the, yeah, the different people you get to meet along the way. And, yeah. And the and, grace that's been shown along the way, right? <laughs> indeed. Yeah. yeah for uh, sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And, and uh, we're going to, we're going to dig in on a lot of different topics today, but um, when, when you and I were talking about some of the, the things that we did want to talk about, yeah. um, you know, as I mentioned, you've had such a variety of, of ways to impact students, and each one of them has been valuable. Each one of them has been different uh, from teaching kids Bible in a class, yeah. obviously important, uh, much more on the educational end there, to counseling them in the counseling office and talking about struggles of, of teenager, dealing with parents going through divorce, mm -hmm. um, dealing with pressures of, of just you know things that they're going through in the, mentally as, as teens. But then also um, in the coaching arena, yeah. in coaching athletes, um, both the the men and the women, uh, middle school and high school, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Track and cross country, yeah. uh, and and obviously you have achieved high level of success um, in in that world, um, as evidenced by the state championships and excellent teams that you've been able to coach. But you've really looked at coaching. Um, as a ministry, yeah, as a, which has influenced how you coach and the philosophy in which you did to where you, I mean, you said to me just unashamedly, you said, that's probably one of my favorite things that I do because of the way I can do that. Yeah. Is that safe to say? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I, I love the variety that I, I get at Sioux Falls Christian. Yeah. You know, wearing those different hats, um, so many different entry points into a, a kid's life, but but you're right. It, it seems as I as I look back over the last, you know, I've been at this for 25 years now. Yeah. The, yeah, the, the coaching has played such a significant role in the way I've been able to connect with kids. And, and honestly, I think if I if I look back, you know, when I first got into education, you know, right out of college, I, I loved athletics, I loved sports, I thought I was good at them. Uh, <laughs> I look back, and it was a pretty unimpressive career that I had as an athlete. Well, it was a different time. It was. <laughs> no super shoes back then, right? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, but honestly, you know, I, I look at it, and, you know, early on, I was, I coached basketball and middle school track. The, those are the two things I started out with. And I, I love basketball, I love the game, I love coaching it, I love teaching it. But every year, we'd have to make cuts. And, and and it just killed me. Like, it, it just didn't align with like my my whole goal. I want to encourage kids. I want to love them. And then to tell a you know a fifteen or sixteen year old boy, you know, sorry, your dream of playing high school basketball is over. And what they hear is, I wasn't good enough. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it was really hard on me. And I was always you know wrestling with that. And you know, by God's grace, there was an opportunity for me to to move into uh, an assistant role with our high school track team at Sioux Falls Christian. Um, so I put basketball uh, to the side. I still got to coach my kids and, you know, little kids stuff. Sure. But, you know, right away when I when I entered into that, and it was 2012 when I became an assistant track coach, um, I started thinking about the things that I'd learned in my counseling office and interacting with kids. And I, and I thought, how can I, now that, you know, I have this, you know, this live audience with kids every day after school, how can I implement some of that into my coaching? Ooh. And then a couple of years later, 2014, I got the opportunity to take over as the head cross country coach. And so then all of a sudden it was, it was my program and I kind of got to write the vision and the mission and, mm -hmm. and start thinking about what, what do we want this to be all about? And it, man, it's been fun. It's been 10 years of that now mm -hmm. that I've been the head coach. Um, when I took over, we, we weren't very good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like we hadn't even qualified for the state meet in nine years. Uh, like hadn't even had yeah. a team at the state uh, meet. And so I, when I came in, I thought, you know, th that wasn't my goal. I wasn't out trying to try to win state championships. Of course, I wanted to be competitive and mm -hmm. have kids maximize the gifts they have. But it, it started out, I, I thought, what are some things that regardless of how fast a kid runs, regardless of how many meets we win, what could we say if, if we do this, we're successful? And 
I'm a pretty simple minded guy. So I started with this, the simplicity of saying, let's go after the ABCs. So the A is attitude. Um, I mean, you know, living in South Dakota, there's, there's stinky weather you got to yeah. deal with. Uh, you never know what your competition's going to be like, but we always think we do get to control our attitude. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, l let's, let's seek to have a Christ-like attitude who, you know, w was a servant, uh, above all. And so we talk a lot about, about the attitude, right? And when we're dealing with t teenagers to try to have them have a good attitude, especially about long distance running. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, it, it's a big challenge, mm -hmm. but we keep putting that before them. Like you get to choose this and mm -hmm. let's choose to have a good attitude. Let's choose to have an attitude that would reflect Christ. Uh, the B just stands for building community. And, and that's so much at the, the core of who I am. I love people. I love yep. being around them. I love uh, giving a, a place for kids to belong. Um, and instead of making cuts like we did in, in basketball, um, you know, but by God's grace, our, our team grew from like 12 kids when I first came on board to, you know, now we're at over 80 kids mm. um, that come out. And it, it just gives a place for kids to belong. And yeah. we can talk more about that later. But, you know, just to keep going, the, the C stands for cultivating discipline. Mm. Um, I, I just think that the things that we learn as an athlete, especially in, in running, especially in distance running, and that the, the discipline, there's no shortcuts yeah. to success. And, and my hope, my, my prayer is that those things they learn about being a disciplined athlete are going to carry over to the classroom. Right. It's going to carry over into the way they interact with their parents and their siblings, uh, the way they'll one day, you know, hold down a job and the way they'll treat their family and just all of that stuff. And so to have that as the, the foundation, mm -hmm. let's chase after the ABCs. Um, like that, that really is what we talk about all the time. And we chase after that. And, and of course there's the, the science of running and writing training plans and all of that. But those are the things that we're after. And right. when you have 80 kids, they're not all good runners. No, they're in not. Fact, in fact, they don't all even like to run. Yeah. But their parents, some of them say your parents, are, <laughs> parents are just like, you got to be involved in an activity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I won't get cut in this sport. Yeah. It, it's so fun, <laughs> right? The, the worst athletes get the most playing time <laughs> when, when you go out for cross country. So yeah, that's like a little selling feature for us, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I, but I love that because what, what you just explained, Luke, is is your coaching philosophy. Yeah. Um, and yes, there are the the practice, the the um, the running, the all, all those the, the shoes, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Which having a cross country runner, you know, you and I have had multiple conversations about running. Mm -hmm. I am not a runner. Yeah. Um, my wife was, as you know, but I am not a runner. Um, and so it's been really fun to enter the world of running through my youngest son Chase, who's yeah. now running collegiately at the University of Sioux Falls. Yeah. But um, you know, he and Derek never got to run together because they were in different classes of high school, but it was always so fun, um, because for some, for somehow those two ended up connecting right, uh, yeah. at, at different meets at yeah. different things. And, um, and they didn't even put it together that you and I were friends. Yeah. Um, but what I loved about that is there is just this community that takes place. I think mm -hmm. in the cross country world, uh, you sure. know, Jeff Lukens, who was on the podcast, mm -hmm. I want to say maybe season three, mm -hmm. we talked about that, that there's just something that is, that is created in a cross country specifically yeah. that, that bonds kids together. Yeah. And so the philosophy that you talk about, that you brought your, your, uh, to your team of the ABCs, mm -hmm. I love because, and here's why, because it truly is transfer transferable to every area of their life, both present and in the future. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, so good. Yeah. It, it, and you're right. I mean, cross country lends itself to that, right? I mean, you go to a meet and everybody's getting cheered for. Uh, yeah. th there's maybe more applause for the last place finisher than there is for the first place finisher. Yeah. And, and that's not normal in a lot of sports. Um, so it does lend itself to that. But, man, I, I'm just so thankful. I, I had no idea when I... You know, when I started working with kids, when I started teaching, when I started coaching, I would have never dreamt that this is where where we'd be right now, mm -hmm. and, and how how powerful you know a silly thing of just putting one foot in front of its uh, another over and over, mm -hmm. how, how powerful that avenue and that you know that entry point into a kid's life would mm -hmm. be. But isn't that really a lot of times um, what life comes down to? Yeah, especially with. Uh, hardships that we all go through yeah you know we've got uh, you know a podcast obviously just a couple weeks ago with with uh jason van ruler that talked about you know we all have different kind of pains we all have yeah. different kind of hurts in our life and some days there are days where it's just like i just got to keep putting one foot in the other i got to get out of bed yeah i got to put one foot in front of the others lace up the shoes and get out yeah the door, right yeah yeah exactly and 
and the attitude in which we bring and and you know being at a uh, school like Sioux Falls Christian yeah. obviously mm-hmm. um, has lended itself very well to to allowing Christ to be a part of all your conversations yeah. your foundation um, and you know you can talk about Christ at every practice yeah. you can pray before every, all those kinds of things yeah. but I love the fact that even so many runners and coaches that I've met um, in my short amount of time mm-hmm. in being a part of the sport is how how many uh, coaches have been connected to faith yeah yeah I've been... well there, there's so many analogies throughout scripture about running the the race and yeah you know it, it really does lend itself to you know a, a really good relationship yeah so let me ask you this Luke because as, as we know there's so much more that's taught versus taught when it yeah. comes to kids right yeah and so I think about the ABCs that you just mentioned, you know, the, the attitude, mm-hmm. uh, the, and the B was building community, building community, and then the creating discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as you think about your own life, yeah, how you live your own life, yeah, how you enter the classroom, how you, um, you know, start practice mm-hmm. as you come home at the end of the day yeah. and see Carla and the two kids that are <laughs> remaining at home, yeah. Eric, when he's home from college, yeah. um, are there some disciplines that that uh, that you've just adopted into your own life yeah. that have really kept you on the straight and narrow and and focused on Christ and living these things out on the daily yeah. uh, in in your own life? Yeah, in, indeed. I mean, I think about the you know cultivating discipline. Um, I mean, obviously, as you know, fellow brothers in Christ, the discipline of being in the Word. There's no substitute for that, mm-hmm. right? And, and maybe I'd compare that to you know, training a distance runner, I mean, there, there's no substitute to actually just running. I mean, you can do weight training and you could be in the pool and you could bike and all that stuff, but like really to become a better runner, you got to, you got to run. Well, to be a disciple of Jesus, to live out the word, you got to be in the word. And so, I mean, that, that's, that, a, that's, that's, that's a cornerstone. It's a foundational part and that, that's nothing new, right? I mean, that's the, the, the basis of being a disciple, but that, that regular rhythm and routine, you know, Jesus says it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth will speak. Mm. I, I need my heart full. I, I talk a lot during the day. <laughs> <laughs> I talk too much. Uh, yeah. Some people would say, Yeah, you're just, you're coming off three class periods oh, in a row to now going to sit at this table with me. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much I have left in me, but you, you, the heart has to be full of yeah, that, right? Yeah. You're the final couple miles of your marathon. Yeah. There you so, go. so you're, you're going to gut it out. Yeah. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then the need for community. And I love the the colleagues I have at Sioux Falls Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think a lot of, about some of my peers who are in just the, the workplace and in, in corporate America. And then I think about what my day is like working with other, other Christian educators who are there because they love the Lord. They love kids. Uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're not just dispensers of knowledge, but we really care about the, the heart and the soul of, of our students. And to be able to spend my day with people like that, uh, I know you had Jake Pettengill on the podcast yeah. not too long ago. Yeah, and, you know, you know Jay Wildster, our superintendent, and just a whole host of characters like that that I get to hang out with every day. Yeah, it, it really is a blessing. So the community is important for me there. Um, the attitude, man, I got to practice what I preach, and yeah. I think about that a lot when I'm about ready to complain about something. I got to do a little gut check. I get to control what my attitude is. There's a lot of things in life out of my control. Yeah. But I get to control that. So. Yeah. Well, and, and I love too that when you talked about attitude, it wasn't just, hey, I'm 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 putting on a happy face. I'm just coming in and and you know, excuse me, doing what I need to do. Yeah. You said it's an attitude of service. Yeah. And yeah. serving others, which yeah. uh I believe that there's many scriptures <laughs> as well that talk about Jesus coming not to be served, yeah, but to serve, right? And that if we're gonna truly be followers of Christ, men um, who are associating ourselves mm-hmm. as fo- as Jesus followers, and by the way, our goal should be to become more and more like Jesus every day. Yeah. Um, then we need to bring that attitude of service, uh, mm-hmm. regardless of where we're at, whether that is in the workplace, in our community, in our homes, our marriages, you know, relationships yeah. with the kids, and and all that kind of stuff. So it's that's that's so good. And you know, Luke, I. I I love the the picture you say, and it's it's a simple picture. And it's probably easy for you to uh, create, you know, analogies and metaphors around the running. Mm-hmm. But the I don't want people to miss what you just said. There is, you know, when you're a distance runner, 
I mean, and I remember again, Chase is like, hey, I got to go out and do a 10 mile run today. I got to do a 14 mile run. Mm -hmm. you know, whether you feel like it or not, you got to get out there and you got to do the work. You got to do the mm -hmm. run. Um, and that's not that's not lessening uh, the role of a sprinter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay? But I think we have like a strong affection towards distance runners because sure. we see the work yeah. that's put in. Yeah. But um, the reality of saying, hey, I may not feel like running today. I may not feel like reading the word today. I may not feel like, you know, making sure that I get up a little bit early or I find a pocket of time in the day or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, and I mean, studies show this. I love the the study that was put out by the, the Center for Bible Engagement several years ago that talked about the impact of spending time in God's word. Yeah. And that if we spend um, four times a week in the word, that's it. So, you, I mean, that's taking into account that you may have three days on, yeah, which right. I think obviously we don't want to do, but like your, your anger goes down by 32%. Yeah. Yeah. Your, um, your loneliness go down, goes down by like 38%. I can't remember the exact percentages, yeah. but read being in the word yeah. is just, it, it naturally just produces fruit the same way that if you get out and, and you run, mm -hmm. your endurance is going to be built. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just as you're talking there, I, I think about the passage in Hebrews 4. It just says the word of God is active. It's living. It's sharp like a double-edged sword. Like it's going to do something. Yeah. <laughs> it says it can penetrate our hearts, right? And yeah. It, it does. It Something happens when we're in the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the same thing you said too about whether you feel like it or not. Sometimes I think it, as Christians, we feel like, well, if my heart's not in it, I don't want to be an inauthentic Christian because maybe it's not real. Maybe it's forced. You know, I think there's something about about rhythm and routine. Even those times when it feels forced, something happens. You talk about Chase going out for a long run, and you know, I think about my my own kids, my athletes, my own sons. When they go out for a long run, something happens, whether they felt like it or not. You know, capillaries expand yeah. and muscles grow. Like something happens, mm -hmm. and the same thing is true when when we engage in scripture reading and in prayer and in corporate worship, mm -hmm. something happens. Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah. that is a great reminder because what I immediately thought of when you said that was there's been a few times in my life, Luke, probably not yours, <laughs> but in mine where I haven't really felt like going to church Yeah, or when we were entering into the church building, um, after a pretty decent sized argument in the car ride over yeah, or <laughs> in the morning. Right. And I'm like, I do not want to be here right now. I'm not coming in with a spirit yeah. of worship, but yet when God, God meets when, yeah, those moments. Yeah. When yeah. we release that and just, you spend time all of a sudden it really does. Okay. It refocuses you on what's important. Yeah. And, and if I, if I just listen to my feelings, mm -hmm. I would turn the car around and yeah. go home yeah. or I'd sit in the parking lot or whatever. Right. But when we battle through and say, no, I'm going to trust that God has something for me. Um, something does happen. Yeah. So that is, man, that's a good reminder today. Yeah. That's, that's really good. That's really good. Um, so let me ask you this because you, um, you've worked with teenagers for so long and, and to say that being a teenager today in 2024 is different than being a teenager back in the early 2000s would be like the understatement of the year. Yeah. What are some of the biggest ways, I guess, that you would say, you know, teenagers have changed yeah. um, if they have? Yeah. Um, or what makes being a teenager today so different from maybe even, not even back when you and I were teens, yeah. but back when you started working sure. with teens? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, Obviously, our culture has changed so much. Yeah. And you think about the, I don't know, just the foundational role that smartphones have in our society, in our kids' society, in their life. They don't know anything different. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, I'm always trying to keep up on that. Like, how is this affecting them? But the thing I keep going back to is I think the basic needs of kids actually stays the same. I think it, it looks different and maybe we need to enter into how to meet those needs differently. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I, mean, I could probably give a, a theological discourse maybe on a different day that this goes way back to before the fall. Like I think already in the Garden of Eden, we see the needs of, of mankind of they need to be loved mm -hmm. and to give love. There, there's a physical needs. There's a need for like autonomy or to know that you matter. And there's a need for community. Mm. And you take those four things and whether you're talking 
you know, 1994 or you're talking 2004 or today in 2024, mm. I still believe that, that every kid is trying to have those, those four things met. And, you know, you think about the need to, to love, to be loved. I, I don't think we could ever take that for granted. We can't ever assume that a kid, well, they just know I love them. They, yeah. they need to be told, they need to be reminded, they need to, they need to know it. And not only do they need to receive love, but I think what I see in kids today, they have such a desire to give it. And so the, the need to serve, the, the outlet to serve, whether it's through their church or through their school or through the community, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an innate need that God has given us to receive and to give. Is that, is that, so you would say that that's even true across the board, just teenagers in general, not in just, not just church kids, right? Yeah. Not just Sioux Falls Christian kids who come from a Christian home. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it would just, that's just teenagers in general. Yeah. I, I think it's mankind in general and, yeah. and you see it maybe play out the most with kids. And the thing is, if, if we don't give them a, a positive, healthy outlet, there's, they're going to find unhealthy ways, Yeah, you know, or whether that's you know, chasing after a boyfriend or girlfriend or, or whatever else it may be. Sure. And the same thing's true for the physical needs. I mean, it goes beyond food, water, and shelter and all that. I mean, I think this is probably more true today than ever before, but just the the physical need that they have to, to be seen, to be heard, to, you know, have somebody, you know, give them a, a pat on the back, a high five, a hug. Our, our, our kids are, are really connected, more connected than maybe they've ever been before. But it's kind of a fake connection. Mm -hmm. You know, a kid will say, well, I talked to so-and-so last night, but it wasn't really, they didn't really talk to him. They maybe Snapchatted like half their forehead and sent him a picture, <laughs> exactly. you know, but right. <laughs> like to keep their streak alive. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But that, that need for like physical interaction, um, you know, I'm so thankful this year we've we've kind of disallowed phones during our school day. Yeah, which is. And, oh. Yeah, what what a what a game changer for that physical, yeah. you know, just interpersonal relationship is so so huge. I, I think it's absolutely huge. I remember, you know, because I did school assemblies for years, yeah. you know, and and you know, I was I was always amazed and and you know, got open the doors in twenty eight different states in five years to do schools, right? Yeah. And it was almost across the board mm -hmm. that students were allowed to bring their phones into the auditorium. Yeah. And you know, and and I'm just like, and we were all alerted too, right? So one thought we had as educators is, let's let's teach them how to use it appropriately. Yeah, let's give them an opportunity to, you know, we'll model it for them. Yeah. And well, that that didn't really work all that well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, I remember even as, as a parent, right? When 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 you give your child their first mm -hmm. smartphone, yeah, right. I mean, um, it, I was my kids are. You know, Zaya's actually first phone was a flip phone back. I mean, <laughs> yeah. when he when he first got one, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but um, and I remember just saying, okay, look, I mean, we we established no phone zones mm -hmm. in our house, yeah. like, and and you had to you had to dock them in this area by eight thirty at night, mm -hmm. and just dad, that's so weird. It's so you know whatever. And then but we had to slowly and incrementally give them more and more freedom, right? Because as they're approaching the college years. It's not like they're going to you know, dock their phone downstairs. No, it's yeah. going to be right next to them in bed. So it's like, okay. So for us personally, we established, all right, as they enter their senior year, yeah. we're going to just have to say, listen, you know what? You're going to have to start making these decisions. Yes. Which is so we're going to We're going to encourage you to do these yeah. things. Um, but that's a much different situation because it's still my home. Exactly. In, in, in the, the school study. In the school, you've got a gajillion different styles of parenting represented. Exactly. And different yeah. kids with different yeah. disciplines. Yeah. Yeah. And abilities even to focus. Yeah. So I remember when I saw that come across, you know, just I don't remember where I where I you know, heard in conversation or whatever that uh, you guys were moving to that. And I was like, wow. And the, my first thought was not so much. I'm sure the kids were like, oh, man, this sucks or whatever mm -hmm. for a little bit. But I was yeah. actually concerned about parents going, hey, what happens if like we got to get a hold of our kids? Yeah. And by the way, if my mom needed to get a hold of me in yeah. school, like well, call the secretary, <laughs> exactly. you know, we do have a phone number at the school. It works. Yeah. You know? Oh, the school still has a landline. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's crazy. I, I, I worried how the kids would react to that. Yeah. And it, they didn't balk at it at all. Like, I mean, the, the lunchroom is way noisier than it was a year ago or two years ago. Yeah. But I think it's because they have that need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to go on too, that, that, that need for like just community, yeah. that need to belong, it's the number one driving force. It, it was when you and I were kids. It was when I started in education. Mm -hmm. It's still the number one driving force in a kid's life. Yeah. 
they, they, they need a place to belong. They need a sense of community. Um, again, I mean, back to the whole coaching thing. I think that's why over 80 kids go out for cross country. Mm. Uh, it's not because they love distance running. I mean, we do have a few that yeah. actually do, yeah. and that's awesome. And I love to help them develop those gifts too, but it's really a place to belong. Yeah. Um, so, so knowing that, would you say that that's really your number one reason for staying in the youth ministry and, and youth focused career as long as you have? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it certainly played a huge role and, and you know this too. I mean, there's something unique about, about those teenage years, so much growth, so much development. It, it, it's such a formative stage of life. Mm -hmm. Uh, such an exciting time of life. Yeah. And, you know, as a teacher, as a coach, to be on the front row and just watch God doing his redemptive work in, in the life of a kid, um, to, to see when, when they kind of get it, mm -hmm. when the Holy Spirit makes a dead heart alive. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's what fuels me to keep going. And then being able to, you know, create an atmosphere, whether it's in the classroom or my office or at chapel or, you know, through the teams, mm -hmm. an atmosphere where, it's conducive for that that work to happen. I mean, that's what that's what fires me up. Yeah, it's what gets me going every day. So, as you're sharing, I'm the what I'm thinking about is okay. So your world mm -hmm. um, has been highly focused, uh, you know, on teenagers and and impacting teens. Mm -hmm. um, there are many that would say like, oh, I don't know if I could ever work with teenagers because they kind of intimidate me. Yeah, I'm not relevant. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have anything to offer. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, you don't have a TikTok channel where you mm -hmm. reenact all the famous new dances or whatever. No, you wouldn't uh, see that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the the thought of relevancy is such a, a an interesting thing because we think we have to be this oftentimes yeah. as adults, right? We yeah. think we have. Well, I don't have the right shoes or the right, you know, uh, or, or the right outfit or whatever. So I don't know if I'll say the right thing. Yeah. But what I'm hearing you say is that none of that necessarily even matters. What matters is that you as an adult, as a man, as a parent, um, is helping create an environment where they feel they belong, yeah. where they feel valued, yeah. listened to, cared for, yeah. um, given... I mean, given some freedoms to fail, yeah, and that's kind of yeah, what I'm hearing. Yeah, for sure. You know, I I always wondered like, what age will I have to be at before kids don't want to talk to me anymore? Yeah, when will you age out? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and and honestly, I, like I I kind of I kind of worried about that, and even thinking about my kids coming up into high school and what would it be like to coach my own children? What would it be like to to teach my own kids? What you know? And I I always kind of wondered and. And, and who knows, you know, th that, that day may come. Um, but I think what, what, what we're talking about here is there are these timeless truths. Again, whether we're back in the 1990s or in 2024, God has put that desire in each and every kid. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to have a degree in, in psychology or in education or in ministry or theology or anything to meet those needs. Um, kids need to know that they're loved and they're cared for. They need to have a pat on the back, and they need to get a hug once in a while. Uh, they they just need to know that somebody's paying attention to them. And when that is our kind of when that's our focus, when we, if we know those things, yeah, it really doesn't matter what your career is, what your talents are. Oh no, because what it is is it it just causes you to because I just think about like the guy, the person that's listening right now that's saying, "Well, I don't, I'm not a teacher, yeah, I'm not a coach, I have no desire to be those things, mm -hmm. right?" But Chances are there's kids in their neighborhood. Yeah. There's, uh, if, if they're going to church, uh, there's children, there's teenagers yeah. uh, in their church yeah. that they could be a part of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think about, um, and I don't know, you know, fully as I'm, I'm sure you had a, a lot of people that invested in you when you were a child and a teenager, um, you know, um, so much of my story and, you know, several months ago there was, uh, uh, you know, Dan Larson was on the podcast and, mm -hmm. um, uh, like years before that was Alan Keysbo sure. and Reed yeah. DeBrays and yeah. these guys that yeah. saw potential in a 14 year old kid yeah. that really had a lot of challenges and struggles, but just encouraged me mm -hmm. that just gave me the pat on the back. Like yeah. you said, that, that truly saw me and cared about like, uh, 
even if what I said was wrong, mm -hmm. they cared about listening mm -hmm. and then corrected me in a way that was, that was, I guess, a little bit more palatable yeah, versus yeah. just, you know, yelling at me or whatever. Right. Sure, yeah. And I, and so, so I just think about as, as it, if someone's out there mm -hmm. that's, that says, man, I, but I can't, I can't do what Luke does. Mm -hmm. What kind of encouragement would you give to that? Yeah. I mean, be, be present, right? Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing, um, I started doing it with my senior Bible class, and we're now trying to roll it out with with all of our high schoolers, is that every kid would pick an adult mentor from their church. Um, you know, I, I teach just seniors, and so I make it a, an assignment as part of the curriculum. They have to meet mm -hmm. with their mentor, you know, five or six times throughout the semester. And my hope is that that will become you know, a, a lifestyle, a discipline that they'll continue even after they're done with my class and they graduate from here. And, and the thing is, I, I hear this from the mentors a lot, like, well, what do we talk about? And and I'll maybe sometimes give them, a, you know, some starter questions, but you, you think, I, I know so much of your ministry right now, you think about the the men's summit and, you know, think about your ministry to men's and to, to dads and whatever. I think it's in, in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. He says, you know, like a father, uh, encourage them, comfort them, and urge them. Mm -hmm. Well, those are things that anybody can do. You, you can comfort, you can encourage, you can urge them. Um, <laughs> you know, I, th I think sometimes about, uh, there's a, a John Wooden qu qu quote, right? You know, the great in, uh, NCAA basketball coach. He says that every young man needs a pat on the back. Some need it up high, you know, <laughs> that a boy, and some need it, you know, down yeah. a little lower. Right? Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's the encouraging and the urging. Right? Yeah. And, I think, again, regardless of what your career path is, regardless of what your educational background is, you know, I think to any dads, any men out there that are that are listening, every kid needs to know that they're noticed. Every kid needs to know that they belong. Every kid needs to be encouraged and every kid needs to be urged. Well, yeah. we all can do that. Yeah. And the, and the urging, it's the thing that I, I, the word that I think about when you're talking about urging is just helping them see the potential oh, that yeah. they may not see. Exactly. And then challenging them to, yeah. to reach for that. Mm -hmm. And not just challenging and say, hey, get after it, but let me help you discover that. Yeah. Yeah. And let me help you like figure out what does that look like yeah. for you? And, you know, we spend so much time and, and now I've been able to operate uh, and, and kind of speak in some corporate settings so much more now. It's mm -hmm. been really wonderful to to enter those spaces because so much time is, is spent on how do we become successful? Right. Yeah. And and so often we determine that and define success based on where offices, car we drive, mm -hmm. money we have, mm -hmm. you know, title, you yeah. know, all those kinds of things, because that's what's um, easy to see. Right. Culture, the world stands for culture, it's all of that. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should strive for greatness in all those areas and, you know, continue to try to climb corporate ladder and all, you know, grow in leadership and all of that. that. That's all great. But yet what really causes us to, to think and feel successful at the end of the day mm -hmm. is our impact on other people. Yeah. And we know. Yeah. I mean, we're like, let's be real. You and I know if we've had a positive impact on people yeah. or if we've had the opposite of that. Exactly. Yeah. And when we've had the opposite, yeah. we don't really go to bed feeling too good about ourselves no. and saying, man, okay, we, we go to bed thinking, okay, God, forgive me for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to go to ask, ask for forgiveness, yeah. you know, and but say, God, help me do that better tomorrow. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's what success is all about. Yeah. And when we help help students see the potential that they don't see in themselves yeah. and and take steps towards growth and maturity and celebrate them with the, along the way yeah man that that brings a, a level of understanding of success that i don't think anything else does. yeah i agree you know when, when you're just saying all that it makes me think of you know one of the coaches that mentored me was bob gary hmm. uh perhaps you know him he he's in the hall of, he's just in, the hall of, in the hall of fame at usf okay you know? <laughs> um, and in the Hall of Fame for South Dakota Coaches Association, okay. and he just retired. He he was on our staff. He just retired after 50 years of coaching track and field. Wow. Um, but he he told me many times. He said, you know, Luke, ki kids aren't going to remember what their fastest times are. They're not going to remember what meets they won, but they will remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, so, that's so true. And I I have to remind that because I. I mean, I, I love to win. I, I love to chase after excellence. And, and I think, you know, the thing that I'm challenging myself with and challenging our kids to do is I, I think the pursuit of excellence can and should be an act of worship. 
like we know that all good gifts come from God. We know that the gifts that our kids have are given by God. And so seeking to use them to their fullest potential, it, it is an act of worship. Um, but at the end of the day, like those things aren't going to matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, I, I try to keep reminding myself of that over and over. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think in the, in the coaching world as dads, sometimes, you know, we, we sometimes can put a little bit too much emphasis on living vicariously through our kids yeah. and through our athletes. Right. <laughs> and, and saying, well, yeah. that's a reflection of, yeah. of me. I, I remember, you know, um, uh, when I, I was talking with, I think it was Chase actually, um, back when he was much younger and was, you know, we were having a conversation about something that he was, wasn't doing quite right. And yeah. he was getting in trouble for something or whatever. And he goes, you just want me to be perfect because of how, of how it makes it look, yeah. how it makes you look, you know, it's a reflection of you. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. first of all, that's a really, you know, mature state to say. Yeah, you're pretty insightful. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but, but even that feeling of yeah. it, so, but it caused me to like, think about it and say, it, is there some truth to that? Yeah. And and kind of enter that self evaluation chamber a little bit and saying, man, I don't ever want that to be my motivation right. for how I parent, yeah. uh, how I you know talk about showing up in the classroom or on the cross country court, or, yeah. you know, to the choir or whatever. I mean, whatever yeah. your kid happens to be engaged in. And, and I think that's why as dads, like we need to keep reminding our kids, like everything you do, do it for the glory of Christ. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and it's good. Let, let's chase after A's and let's chase after new PRs on the course. Sure. Let, let's chase after excellence. That's fine. But let's do it to bring glory to him and yeah. do it as a way to honor what he's given to us. That's stewardship. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That's stewardship. Yeah. I mean, we just want to steward, steward yeah. those gifts. Yeah. And, uh, and at the end of the day, you know, I, I remember years ago, Luke, and when, when it was, it, I don't remember which book it was, uh, that Max Lucado wrote, but you know, he, he wrote a gajillion of them for a yeah. while, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and but one of them just talked about how um, one of the most important things that we can tell our kids after we watch them run, perform, play, whatever it is, mm-hmm. right, is just, man, it is just so fun watching you run yeah. or yeah. play basketball or perform well in the classroom yeah. or in the choir. Just, yeah. It's so fun to watch you play. Yeah. Right. Yep. Whatever it is. Yeah. Um, because that's what God looks at us. Exactly. And says, yeah. You know, um. First of all, I love like free flowing conversations like this because you yeah. never know how the Lord's going to take you. But yeah. it reminds me of something that God just just taught me that I'm still just marinating in. And so many times I can struggle with, you know, perfectionism mm-hmm. and wanting everything to just, especially like with uh, you know the men's summit coming up and yeah. and just always wanting to do everything to the highest level of accidents. Right. Yeah, I mean that's just what what, what it's in your DNA. It's right? in my yeah. DNA, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so. But I was at this event uh, with uh, 50 pastors and speakers, and it was just this where we could just take the mask off and just t- just be open and say, mm-hmm. man, God, we just need you, right? Yeah. And the picture that the Lord gave me was that, uh, you know, when our kids were little and they um, drew us a picture, mm-hmm. when they gave it to us, or you know, never once did I look at it and say, "Man, you know, this head <laughs> is really disproportionate with the body. Um, this coloring is a disaster." Mm-hmm. No, what did I do? I, I took it and I said, "This is amazing," yeah. and I can't wait to hang it in my office. Yeah. And I still have some of my boys' stuff hanging yeah. in my office, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I wish they'd draw me new pictures. By the way, they might be better, <laughs> but but at any rate, but but the, the the thing that I really got out of that was that when God looks at you and I, mm-hmm. even it's just as men, and I would just tell men out there that are listening. When God looks at you and I, he doesn't look at what we're drawing, the the product of what we're drawing. Yeah. He just looks at us and says, I love that you're drawing. Yeah. I, yeah. I love, I I love what you're creating, the right. art you're creating, whatever that art may be. Yeah. And that was just such a word from the Lord that I needed because I I can place so much pressure, and I know that I'm not alone in this, yeah. on performance. Yeah. Right. Or production. For sure. Um, you know, all those different kinds of things. Yeah. That that uh, and God just says, Man, I know your heart. Mm-hmm. Just, just, just yeah. keep me as the focus. Yeah, like you said, yeah. to, to the glory of run to the glory of God. Do everything you can to the glory of God, and just, yeah, just know that I would love watching you, quote unquote, play. Yeah, yeah that's so good. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. So the the focus on kids is obvious, and teenagers. I just feel like when I say kids, you know, teenagers yeah. are like, wait, we're not kids, but um, <laughs> but that's always been you know front and center. Yeah. But you and I both know, and, and this is even from back when I was a youth pastor in Portland, Oregon, mm-hmm. um, a lot of our ministry is not just to teenagers, it's to parents. Yeah. 
right? Mm -hmm. Um, And just you are ministering, you're caring for parents of teens that you're coaching, Mm -hmm. of kids that are coming into the counseling office, to the Bible classroom, all that kind of stuff. Um, So as you think about just parents and the needs that they have, um, what kind of, number one, what kind of encouragement would you give to parents today? Yeah. Um, and let's just start there and then I'll ask you the second question. But what kind of encouragement would you give to parents today? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of it goes back to those needs that we talked about, H- helping meet those needs in a healthy way, giving opportunity for your kids to find a healthy community. Uh, don't let them just go down to the basement and turn on the Xbox or just go to their room and sit on their phone. Because um, I, I think when they're doing that, I mean, it's so crazy. Even when you're on your phone, you're still part of like an online community. Mm-hmm. Um, it's crazy. You can go down and turn on the Xbox and you're gaming with your friend who's in a different basement, you know, <laughs> or across, country. Or, yeah, right. <laughs> so I think a lot of that speaks to the need that they have for community, but I don't think that's authentic community. And so encouraging your kids to, you know, be part of a club, to be part of a team, to get a part-time job, to you know, to be involved in community, go to youth group, be part of the service organizations, all of that. I I think that's one thing I would encourage parents to do. And and I know sometimes that's hard because it ends up meaning we got to drive them to the next thing and we're busy and we're tired and all of that. Mm -hmm. But kids need to belong. And if they don't find a healthy place, there's plenty of unhealthy places for them to get that. So what, so what do you do, Luke, if, Mm -hmm. if, and I'm sure you could run across this because you deal with all sorts of personalities of students. But you have you have certain students that would classify themselves more as loners, yeah. and they're like, "I no, I'm not doing that." Yeah, and it becomes like World War Three in the home. Yeah, where it's like, yeah. "No, I'm not going to go to this club. I'm not going to go and do this. You can't make me do it." You know, yeah, that's the hard part of parenting yeah. teens, especially as they're growing in their independence. Yeah, you want to grant them that independence, but you know what's best for them. Yeah, so ha- like, what kind of encouragement would you give to those parents that that have teens that are just kind of fighting any kind of connection with others. Yeah. Well, I, I would say, first of all, the, the connection doesn't have to hinge on, on the school setting. So it doesn't need to be band or choir or sports. I mean, those, those are all great opportunities. And yeah. Obviously, that's the world I live in, and I see so many, so many great opportunities that come from the school setting. But there's so many things in our community, too. I mean, you think about a kid who doesn't like, they're not interested in athletics or they're not interested in music. Well, go to the outdoor campus. There's so many opportunities to get involved there with mm-hmm. outdoor education and, and serving there. Or you don't like that that setting, go to the, the Washington Pavilion. I mean, there's so many things that kids can get connected in that would fit their interests, that would fit mm-hmm. their niche. Um, you know, the church, right? There's so many opportunities in each and every one of our churches to get mm-hmm. plugged in. Um, so I, I think one thing I would say is don't limit your scope to thinking, it has to be tied to their educational system, yeah. which I think a lot of times we do, right? We want our kids in the choir. We want our kids in the marching band. We want our kids in the volleyball team. Like, But there's so many other avenues out there. So don't force them into the thing that, that maybe that's where you found your community back yeah. when you were a teenager. Yeah, that's really good because because a lot of times that does influence mm-hmm. the way that we yeah. we instruct yeah. our kids. It's like, I, well, I, it worked for me, so why doesn't it work for you? Yeah. You know, I, I can remember... You know, a handful of years ago, I, I had a parent that reached out to me that, you know, we want our daughter to get plugged in and she's not into these things that her friends are into and we don't want her just coming home every day after school. And, you know, we have like a little before school and after school uh, kids program for elementary students whose kids' parents are at work. I said, well, you know, maybe that would be an, an avenue. And, and wouldn't you know it, the girl ended up getting a little part-time job, working in our after school kids program that turned into finding out she loved kids. Mm -hmm. Now she's studying education. She's going to be an elementary school teacher. And so sometimes those things lead to a career path. And sometimes it just meets a a temporary need. But Mm -hmm. I I would just say, think creatively, look for opportunities to Mm -hmm. think about others. Again, we need to be loved. We also need to give love. Mm -hmm. And so find those places where you can do that. Yeah. And I think that what's so key there too is, is, you know, having intentional conversation with your kids Mm -hmm. and saying like, what are you interested in? And again, sometimes there's a, such a tough outer shell oh, oh, that you can't even get that question answered. Yeah. But it's it's continuing to just show up. Yeah. It's continuing to say, hey, I, I'd love to be able to discover 
this yeah. with you yeah. and help you discover that yeah. as opposed to allowing the frustration to rise within us, mm -hmm. which is often what it does because we're like, why don't you just get it? Yeah. You know, we, don't, we want you to be happy, you know, like that yeah. kind of thing. So, um, so, so that's good. And, and, ha and having those intentional conversations and maybe that is uh, an answer to this follow-up question. And you mentioned the church and I think about, mm -hmm. because again, um, for, for the church, um, it's often thought of when parents are kind of at their wits end. Yeah. Well, I'll just take my kid to youth group. Yeah. <laughs> and the youth pastor yeah. and all those people that love teenagers, mm -hmm. they can fix it. Yeah. Um, but I just think about the the church and ways that that our churches can help parents parent. Yeah. And um, one of the things I think that um, that comes to mind, and you mentioned it, we've talked a lot about how. Um, the needs of kids is to be loved, valued, listened yeah. to. Yeah. Let's not forget the fact that you and I as grown men, we need to be loved, valued, listened to. Parents need to be loved, valued, yeah. listened to. And so creating safe environments for parents to be real and yeah. saying, man, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling. And to and because every parent, at least a, a lot of parents, I shouldn't say such a generalization, a lot of parents uh, will feel like they're the only one. Yeah. And that again, if their kid is feeling this way, it must be their fault. Yeah, that doesn't mean that they maybe haven't done a, made a few mistakes. Yeah, but yet, again, our projection of our own inadequacies, and yeah. so then we don't want to seek that help. Right. But yeah. but so with all of that, as you think about the the many hats that you've gotten away, where the many ways you've been able to minister both teens and parents for many years, it was in the church. Mm -hmm. how, how do churches help parents more than they are? Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question, Tom. Um, you know, I try to think of the name of the book, but there's I, I know when I was in youth ministry, um, just towards the, the last couple of years, I was starting to think how do I how do I help equip or help both mm -hmm. parents? And I know that so much of that's what you're starting to do now through ResGen. Yeah, and and I don't know that I have the answers other than to say there is that that need that is there. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, th I think a you know a, a youth pastor, they're caring for the kids and they're providing a place for them, but right along with that, they need to help support uh, parents too. Mm -hmm. I know as a school, we're we're wrestling with that too. Um, how, how do we provide a place and you know whether that's a, you know, you know we, we have a few little small groups of moms that that will meet in the morning or places that, you know, we just did a whole social media thing this fall and then bunch of parents came to our little yeah. you know parent night and so i i think things like that are important but i also know this that it, it's so easy to isolate ourselves um i mean i, I think it the, the devil loves it when we're isolated mm -hmm. um he, he loves he loves the dark and jesus says i'm the light right and so somehow just getting over that hurdle of not thinking you're the only one not not leaving yourself isolated but finding other people being willing to connect with other people is so important. Yeah. No, I, th I think that that is very good. And for us to, so, because I think about parents out mm -hmm. there that, that might be struggling with their, with yeah. their teenagers, um, which a lot of times when we're struggling with our teenagers, that causes struggles within our marriage. Yeah. You know, because there's not necessarily seeing an eye to eye mm -hmm. on just how we're going about, you know, taking care of whatever kind of behavioral modification we wish was there yeah. or heart change that we'd like to see or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think there's just this, un when we understand that there are other people journeying with us yeah. um, and not always able to give, it's, it's I'd like to call it as the ministry of presence, yeah. right? Where it's not like, hey, yeah. we're not giving you answers. Yeah. And, I, and I love that you said, I mean, I really do love the answer that you gave Luke and said, you know, I don't know that I have an answer, yeah. but I would say it's definitely something that is needed. And I, and that, I think more parents, myself included, I need to answer that way. I don't have an answer, yeah. but I care. Let, let, yeah, let's I talk care, about it. and let's. Yeah, I think about that a lot, you know, because my whole livelihood kind of depends on the fact that I can dispense knowledge as a teacher. I give wise counsel. I give advice as a counselor. Um, I give instructions. I make kids do things they don't want to do as a coach. Yeah, <laughs> but, but those are like the the three things that you're going to strike out with as a parent. Mm -hmm. If if you think that your job is just to let them know what you know to give them advice and to instruct them to do things that are hard. And what they need is they need to know that they're loved. Mm -hmm. They need to know that they're cared for. Um, now, it, 
along the way, we do get to teach, we do get to counsel, we do get to urge them on. But yeah, if all we were were d dispensers of knowledge, if all we became as dads were advice givers, and I, I think our kids would roll their eyes and go to their rooms and get on their phone. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that doesn't mean that, that there aren't situations that require correction. Oh, or I'm not saying that at all. Or discipline. Yeah. yeah. But, it's, but again, it's done in love. Yeah. And it's yeah. done where they understand that mm -hmm. this, is for, this is for the betterment of who they are. You think about um, we are called to obey the commands mm -hmm. that God gives us. Yeah. And they're given out of what? Out of love, out of love, yeah, yeah, because he knows what's best for us. Yeah, as and I and I always, I mean, I've said this probably multiple times on the podcast. I've said it multiple times in messages. Is that I hundred percent believe that adults are just older teenagers. Yeah, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> some of the same insecurities and all of that. Right? To yeah, yeah, totally. And yeah. and there's times where we still we need to be corralled. Yeah, right. Yeah, and oftentimes the best corralling that takes place is in that community where you know you're cared for. Yeah. Right. And so I mean, that's why I'm so passionate about Band of Brothers, having men who yep. know other men who at a deep level that can that can encourage you. Right. Yeah. But that can also say, hey, bro, man, just I think be real. Just a touch, yeah. you know, maybe you're a little bit out of line here. So I said, there's two paths yeah, in the, the back. Two paths, yeah. One up here and yeah. one down there. Like, <laughs> exactly. hey, you know, sometimes it's encouragement and sometimes it's to be redirected. And, yeah. And, and as parents, we we need to make sure we do both of those. Right. Yeah. 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 And and uh, and love is the guiding principle the same way that. Yeah. That uh, and. That whole idea of, of you know, consequences that that come out of things. There, there's some natural consequences. Yeah. Um. But yet there's forgiveness and love, and um, statements of saying that, hey, this is you. You are still a value. One of my one of my uh, Laura's aunts and uncles always talked to me when we were, our boys were teenagers. I was just like, and they just, I just love them as parents. I remember talking them, with them on the phone, and they said, one of the things, Tom, for you to really think about. Is just you know what are, what are what are behavioral issues and what are heart issues totally and yeah. thinking more like what we want to do is we want to help grow their heart yeah you know behavior modification will just change as their heart continues yeah. to grow and that's where again coming back to your ABCs mm -hmm. those are heart things yeah and when we help kids when 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 we make sure our heart mm -hmm. has those as the philosophy of life yeah. things just seem to go a lot smoother really in all aspects yeah. right Indeed. yeah yeah yeah. 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 Well, brother, this is this has been so good, and I, I'm so grateful for the time that uh, that you gave. I know you had a very busy day, and yet you found and, and made time to to come and, and be a part of of the podcast today. And and uh, you know, the conversation for me was was just it was fun, just because again our, our relationship for so many years and just seeing how God has used you, and and I know God's going to use the conversation we just had to to bless and, and encourage our listeners here today. But we end our we end our time, as you know, with something that we call the final word, just kind of kind of thirty to ninety seconds, whatever um, that the Lord kind of lays on your heart uh, could be encouragement, challenge, just kind of a final word for for listeners today. So, uh, do you got kind of a final word that uh, that you that God's put on your heart? Yeah, I remember I, I talk a lot, so then I keep <laughs> that to thirty to ninety seconds or whatever you said. I'm cutting you off at ninety. <laughs> yeah, you know. I have a, a, a passage, a paraphrase passage hanging on my, my office wall. Um, you know, we we got a bunch of trophies and a bunch of, you know, pictures of state championship teams. Uh, but above all of that, I just have this passage from, from 2 Timothy that just says, fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith. Mm. And I think it's a worthwhile pursuit to, to keep fighting, to keep pushing. You know, you talked about chasing after excellence and yeah. you know achievement that's great fight the good fight finish the race right the perseverance that we see in distance runners the perseverance it takes to be in in ministry for a quarter of a century you think about it that way mm -hmm. yeah it's a long time <laughs> we've been at this for a yeah. while man a uh, very long time <laughs> you know like yeah finish the race keep pushing but at the end of the day if we don't keep the faith if we don't have our eyes fixed on jesus the author and perfecter of our faith it, it's all for naught right mm -hmm. you know I, I know we've talked about this before but you know, may the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, right? Just to quote that old hymn, it, it's so true. Yeah. You know, I remember the first time we won a state title, I thought it would change my life. It, it, it doesn't, right? Yeah. And it's, it's a worthwhile pursuit to want to be excellent. But if you're not keeping the faith in the middle of it, it it's all for naught. Yeah, that's so good. Well, Luke, thank you. Thanks for your friendship. Thanks yeah, for your thank commitment you. to, to um, kingdom work. 
uh, your focus on teenagers and their families yeah. uh, for the long haul. Uh, you truly are making an impact in so many ways. Um, and I know that you know that, but hear that from me yeah. today. Um, and I'm just uh, deeply grateful for, for your friendship and our, and our time here together. So thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Appreciate you too, man. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Luke Vanderlees today. As always, if you found this episode helpful, I encourage you to share it with others that may find it helpful as well. If you'd like to connect more with Luke, you can find him on the Sioux Falls Christian website, SiouxFallsChristian.org, and on Facebook. Lastly, don't forget to head to ResGen.org to check out all the information and to grab your tickets for ResGen Men's Summit 2024, which is coming up on Saturday, February 3rd. All right, that's all for today. Thanks again for joining me, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the ResGen Giving Life Podcast. Until then, continue being men whose life in Christ gives life to others. Thank you.